First Chronicles chapter 21 happens to be one of the stories that I love in the Bible. Uh, there are just some stories that get my goat, if you know what I'm saying. And I love this story. I don't necessarily love how it starts out, but I love the end results. And isn't it amazing? Only God takes things that are a mess and does something great with them. And this is one of those chapters, and I've uh, used it over the years a few times, but the Lord began to speak to my heart on a little thought, and I hope it'll be a help to us tonight. First Chronicles chapter 21, we'll begin reading in verse number 1, and the Bible says this, uh, And state, Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. David said to Joab and to the rulers of the people, Go number Israel from Beersheba, even to Dan, and bring the number of them to me that I may know it. And Joab answered, The Lord make his people an hundred times so many more as they be. But my lord the king, are they not all my lord's servants? Why then doth my lord require this thing? Why will he be a cause of trespass to Israel? Nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab. Wherefore, Joab departed and went throughout all Israel and came to Jerusalem, and Joab gave the sum of the number of the people unto David. And all they of Israel were a thousand thousand and a hundred thousand men that drew the sword and Judah was four hundred and three score and ten men that drew the sword. But Levi and Benjamin counted he not among them, for the king's word was abominable to Joab. And God was displeased with this thing, therefore he smote Israel. Now look at verse 18. Then the angel of the Lord commanded Gad to say to David, that David should go up and set up an altar unto the Lord in the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. And David went up at the saying of Gad, which he spake in the name of the Lord, and Ornan turned back and saw the angel and his four sons with him hid themselves. Now Ornan was threshing wheat. And as David came to Ornan, Ornan looked and saw David and went out of the threshing floor and bowed himself to David and his face to the ground. Then David said to Ornan, Grant me the place of this threshing floor, that I may build an altar therein unto the Lord. Thou shalt grant it to me for the full price, that the plague be stayed from the people. And Ornan said unto David, Take it to thee, and let my lord the king do that which is good in his eyes. Lo, I give thee the oxen also for burnt offerings and the threshing instruments for wood, and the wheat for a meat offering. I give it all. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. Lord, we've enjoyed the good testimonies. Lord, those that testified were not ashamed to say they were glad they were saved by the good grace of God. They are glad for what you've done in their lives. Some said you've answered prayer. Some said he's glad to be able to come to the house of God. Some referred to these folks being their family. And God, uh, Lord, how you've helped them and strengthened them in the midst of turmoil through the promises of the word of God. Lord, the testimonies certainly were a blessing. Lord, we thank you for the good singing. Lord, we thank you for being a good God and allowing us to be here tonight. We thank you for the reading of the Word of God. Now, I pray you'd help us from it. I pray you'd enlighten our minds and touch our hearts and our lives. And God, do something tremendous in our midst even this very night. Now, Father, we love you. Thank you for first loving us. And thank you in advance what you're going to do around here. And God, I pray you'd get glory and honor in everything that's said and done. Lord, if there's anybody here tonight unsaved, I pray tonight be the night of their salvation. God, if there's somebody here tonight saved, but they've grown cold and indifferent on God, Lord, I pray tonight would be the night revival breaks out in their heart. God, I pray for the choicest saint of God. God, you'd bless them and do something special for them. 
I pray for those that, Lord, have labored hard this week and they're weary in body. I pray you'd strengthen them tonight. I do pray for those that are sick. I pray for Miss Veronica, you'd touch her and others that are sick. And I pray for those that are providentially hindered, that God, you'd touch them and help them. And then, Father, I certainly do pray for Miss Janet's daughter. She's recovering from surgery. You'd touch her. Now, Father, help us to set in heavenly places tonight. Again, use this unworthy vessel and glorify your namesake. We'll bless you for it. In Jesus' holy name we do pray. Amen and amen. I want to draw your attention to a couple things. I want you to notice, first of all, that David is manipulated by the devil. Look again at verse number 1. The Bible says, And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. Can I say the devil is always at work? He's always trying to get you to do the opposite thing that God wants you to do. He's always trying to rob you from the blessings of God. Jesus told us in John chapter number 10, referring to the devil, he said, The thief cometh not but for to steal, kill, and destroy. That's what he wants to do. He wants to rob you of your joy wants to kill your testimony, uh, wants to destroy your life and your family. That's what he's hard at work at doing, friends. He manipulated David in this text. Uh, and if you're not careful, uh, he'll manipulate you. Uh, the b best thing you can do is never give him an ear. When he comes by and tries to fill your head with nonsense, uh, the Bible says resist the devil and he'll flee from you. And if you're not careful, you'll start listening to him. If you start listening to him, then everything he says is going to make perfect sense, and you're going to act on what the devil says. Uh, you'd be better off just do what God says. Uh, we find he's manipulated by the devil. Dangerous thing. Mm, I want you to notice also, he had a messenger to warn him. Look at verse number 3. The Bible says... And Joab answered, The Lord make his people a hundred times so more, many more as they be. But my lord the king, are they not all my lord's servants? Why then doth my lord require this thing? Why will he be a cause of trespass to Israel? Joab warns David. He says, You know, uh, if the Lord be for us, who can be against us? Uh, the Lord makes us greater and mightier than uh, we'll ever be. Yeah, you know that's what's wrong with America. America's had it so good for so long. Uh, 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 they think we can just show up and win the fight. Uh, but you know when America was great? When America trusted in God. Uh, Hey, the greatest generation uh, was when we sent them 18, 19, 20-year-old boys uh, over there and fought that uh, Nazi army that was a well-oiled machine. Uh, what gave us the victory? Our skills? Uh, no. Uh, our technology? No. Uh, uh, if God be for us, who can be against us? Uh, America was uh, a godly nation then, uh, and people were praying for those young men that went there, uh, and we secured a victory because of the God that fought for us. Uh, I want to tell you something. We've got great technology, and we have great infrastructure in our military, but I'd fear going up against Russia and China and all of them right now because America's turned their back on God. Amen. Can I say God sent a messenger to warn David? How many times has God warned you and I only for us to ignore the message and do as the devil manipulates us to do. You better take heed to the scriptures. You better take heed to the warnings from God. God just doesn't send a message because he's bored. God's trying to help us. He's trying to warn us. He's trying to forewarn us. He's trying to edify us and build us up. He's trying to do a work in our lives. We see David's manipulated by the devil. David had a messenger to warn him, but David's mistake was costly. Look at verse number 7. And God was displeased with this thing, therefore he smote Israel. Look at verse 14. So the Lord sent pestilence upon Israel, and there fell of Israel 70,000 men. David's choice cost 70,000. 
thousand men their lives. Seventy thousand homes were affected in Israel. Seventy thousand families were affected. There were wives whose husbands didn't come home. There were children whose daddies did not come home. You say, God's a mean God. No, it was David's choice. And can I say tonight, our choices have consequences. Amen. Friend, you may think you're just having a good time. You may think that it only affects you. No, 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 no. Our choices have consequences. People around us will get hurt. We better choose to stick with the Lord. We better choose to mind the Lord. We better choose to be obedient to the Lord. David knew it was a sin to trust in the number of people. He was a warrior. He was a general of generals. David knew what it was to trust in God, but David had gotten comfortable. And he got to listening to the devil. You notice every time David got comfortable, he got in trouble. You remember the battle of the kings? He was supposed to be out there fighting. He said, I'm going to sit this one out. And he decided to walk out on the porch, and he looks over and he saw Bathsheba. And he had to have her, even though she was the wife of one of his most loyal subjects. Can I say that cost David four sons? And can I say this poor decision cost David 70,000 men in Israel? His mistake was costly. Um, but can I help you with something here? David was moved to repent. Look at verse 17. And David said unto God, Is it not I that commanded the people to be numbered? Even I it is that have sinned and done evil indeed. But as for these sheep, what have they done? Let thine hand, I pray thee, O Lord my God, be on me and on my father's house, but not on thy people, that they should be plagued. He repented. He admitted he was the reason the plague had come. He admitted it was his sin. Aren't you glad we got a God that when we repent, he says that if we'll repent and confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness? David got right with God in that verse. Now notice David finds mercy. Look down at verse 26. And David built there an altar unto the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings and called upon the Lord. And he answered him from heaven by fire upon the altar of the burnt offering. And the Lord commanded the angel and he put up his sword again into the sheaf thereof. David found the mercy of God. The plague stopped because David repent and he offered up sacrifice unto the Lord. He had works meet for repentance. And we find that he found mercy. Now, I don't have time to get into the real message behind this text. The real message is, is that Ornan's threshing floor went on to become the place where Solomon built his temple. The greatest edifice ever known to man was built on this very, very place. This is Mount Moriah. And could I say, God did a great work in a place that was birthed because of a plague. How many of you, your life was in a gutter, but look what God's done. Uh, and God specializes in taking the base things and confounding the wise. Uh, some of you were the off of the world. Some of you, your lives were a mess. Some of you, uh, you were so far in sin, you didn't know how to get out. You was drowning in your depravity, but God came by. And tonight, you're in the house of God. Tonight, uh, you're carrying a Bible. Tonight, uh, you know the Lord. Tonight, uh, you have song of praise unto God in your lips. Uh, your life don't even resemble what it used to be because God stepped into your life and changed you. I'm interested in verse 23 tonight. Verse 23 says this, And Ornan said unto David, Take it to thee, and let my lord the king do that which is good in his eyes. Lo, I give thee the oxen also for the burnt offerings, and the threshing instruments for wood, and the wheat for the meat offering. I give it all. I'm going to preach with God's help on this thought. 
holding nothing back. Ornan gave it all. Ornan gave his threshing floor. He gave his oxen. He gave his threshing instruments. He gave his wheat. I mean, he gave everything to the king. He gave it all, Brother Donald. He gave uh, this week's groceries and the next six months' groceries away that day. He gave it all to the king. He held nothing back. I wonder what kind of church we'd have if we wouldn't hold anything back. I'm not talking about your material things. I'm talking about your heart. I wonder if we just quit being reserved and just let the Lord have it all. Hmm? If we just lose our dignity and our pride and our selfishness and say, I'm done with all of that, I'm just going to lay it all on the altar and give it all to God. I'm not going to hold anything back anymore. I'm not going to worry about what somebody thinks about me. I'm just going to serve the Lord. He held nothing back. Now, I want you to get the mindset of Ornan. And then realize he held nothing back. Can I say he held nothing back regardless of history? You have to understand that Ornan's family owned that threshing floor for 430 years. That's his whole history. Now, unlike today, how many of you know this phrase, the old home place? Other than Clint, how many of you still know where the old home place is and you got ties there? Just a couple. Huh? So we used to know what the old home place meant. It's where he was raised. Well, our family was raised. That was our little parcel of ground. But see, we move around so much and buy and sell and, you know, swap off houses and all that kind of stuff. We have no ties to anything. And that day, your whole identity was about the home place. And 430 years, that's almost double how long America's been here. That's how long his family owned that place. And so regardless of history, he held nothing back. He gave it all. Hmm. Gave it all. Didn't give any thought to those 430 years. Now I've known some people that if you sit in their seat at church... They're going to get in a foul spirit and it's going to grieve the Holy Ghost because they've been sitting there for 430 years. Their favorite song is, I shall not be, I shall not be moved. Because that's their seat. This might shock you. I still am invited to preach places where they got the names on the ends of the pews of who uh, bought that pew. And heaven help you if you sit in their family pew. Huh? You ask me, so that we've been, so, we've been places, sit, just go in and sit down. People come and say, that's my seat. Now, you know me. Part of me wants to say, not today it's, it, it, it isn't. <laughs> but I'm kind. Uh, let me help you something. None of us own a seat in here. All of this belongs to him. Huh? You want to sit somewhere? Get there before other people do. It's not real tough. Well, that's my seat. No, it isn't. But 430 years, that threshing floor was known. That's Ornan's family. But he held nothing back. Hmm? We tend to put too much emphasis on things we need to let go. Now, let me have something. The Lord will never ask you for something that he's not going to replace it with something better. That's, that's important to understand. We don't let things go because we have such attachment to it, and most of the time it's an emotional attachment. 
But can I say, if the Lord asks it, it's because he has a reason. It might be because your emotion attached to that is causing your emotion attached to him to be lacking. Or it may be that he needs that to affect somebody else's life. In any instance, he has a reason. The Bible says our life is not our own. We've been bought by a price, the precious blood of the Lord Jesus. So if he owns you, he owns it. And you need to realize that sometimes, that it's his anyway. He held nothing back regardless of the history. Can I say this? He held nothing back despite how hard it was. Can I give you an indictment with modern day Christianity? Modern day Christianity wants the easy way out. We want great revival to fall, change our entire world, and change it in a great way, but we want to do it without paying a price. Revival never comes without paying a price. It will always cost to have revival. It will cost us time in prayer. It will cost us time of getting our hearts right with the Lord. There's a great cost in revival. But can I say modern Christianity wants everything easy? Mm -hmm. We just want to show up. I mean, Brother Clint, we don't want to have to read our Bible and pray all week long and and seek the Lord and meditate on God. We just want to show up and he just fall into place and we go to the house saying, boy, wasn't it good to be there? We'll see you next week, Lord. But you see, some things in serving God aren't easy. Can I say crucifying your flesh every day is not easy? Sometimes it's hard to pray especially when you don't understand what God's doing. Because God has an innate ability of not always explaining to us what he has on the agenda. Amen. Sometimes he just asks and expects us to follow. But Orden gave it all despite how hard it was. Amen. Hmm. The history of owning that threshing floor at his family for 430 years and him just telling David, here, you can have it. That wasn't easy. See, he saw the angel with the sword drawn and he knew that 70,000 had lost their life and David said, this is the only way to stay the wrath of God. It wasn't easy, but he gave it all. And holding nothing back, sometimes it's not easy. Boy, it rolls off the tongue being easy. Mm. I cringe. I heard a guy last night say, Boy, from this day forward, I'm never going to do... Boy, I cringe. When you say you're never going to do anything again or you're changing your life from this day forward, you know who's listening, the same one that manipulated David in this chapter. He'll say, Okay, big boy, we'll see. Boy, I cringed last night. I, like, I knew he meant well. When he said that, something in my side of me said, Oh, Lord, help that fella. Uh, can I say, sometimes it's hard. But despite how hard it is, he held nothing back. Hmm. I've told this story before. It bears worth repeating because it just came into my mind. It's not in my notes. There's a pastor in Asheville, North Carolina, by the name of Ralph Sexton, Jr. And back in the 80s, there was a theater in Asheville. Now, you've got to understand, Asheville is the buckle to the belt of the Bible belt. There was a theater in downtown Asheville that decided to go very liberal and allow a lot of homosexual activity and all that. I'm talking about in downtown Asheville. And Brother Ralph called up all the other pastors in the area and said, we can't stand for this. This is our town. We're not letting the devil bring all that here and affect our town. All the pastors, we're with you, Brother Ralph. What are we going to do? He said, let's have a parade. 
and we'll march down the middle of the street and we'll let everybody know we're against this thing. They all said, we're with you. So Brother Ralph got the parade permit. Police came out and they blocked off the main street. People began to gather. They're thinking the fire trucks are going to come and oh, they're going to throw candy to the kids, you know, like they do at parades. Everybody's lined up. Ralph's there and he keeps looking at his watch. Keeps looking at his watch. Not one other preacher showed up. All dejected and worried, he said, what am I going to do? And the Lord said, you're going to do what I told you to do. So he walked out onto the yellow line in the middle of Main Street, Asheville, and he started at one end of town and went to the other and began to preach the Word of God. They laughed at him, they mocked him, they threw things at him. When he got to the other end of that thing, he was really dejected. He got in his car feeling like a total failure. But just like the Lord, he just kind of spoke to his heart and said, Ralph, you did exactly what I told you to do. You're just as successful if everybody in this town got saved. Holding nothing back brings a word from heaven like that. Regardless of how hard it is. Now fast forward 40 years and Asheville, North Carolina is totally given over to that lifestyle. It's sad. It is totally, totally sad. You see, when you hold back like those other pastors, there's consequences. Ornan held nothing back regardless of history, despite how hard it was, but also in spite of how horrified he was. That's all he'd known. His entire life was that threshing floor. And I done told you, he gave all the weed away. Is he going to feed his family? He gave his oxen away. How's he going to work a field? He gave his instruments away to be burnt. He has nothing left. Now, I know you got an S on your chest and wear a red cape. But when you give it all and hold nothing back, there's some anxiety comes with that. There's some fear comes with that. You know why people, Brother Donald, don't give it all? An old adage says, fear of loss is greater than fear of gain. The hope of God blessing and turning your world upside down for His glory is not as great is the fear of losing that little bit of change you got in your pocket. Losing that little bit of whatever it is you're holding on to. The reason we don't have great revivals, we're afraid. And we hold back. He was horrified, but he gave it all anyway. Can I say this? He held nothing back regardless of the hidden the unknown. Hmm. He didn't know what would happen. When you walk by faith, you don't know what's going to happen. But he still gave it all. Years ago, when I first started preaching, can you believe it's been 35 years? Lord have mercy. I'm getting old. I had no problem preaching on faith. Kind of like somebody tell you how to raise a baby and they never had one. <laughs> oh, I can tell you how to live by faith. I worked in the corporate world and every payday, Jordan got toys, Miss Nick got dresses, and we didn't, we didn't really want for anything. Life was good until God called me to pastor. 
I went from corporate world, and Brother Ray, Miss Pam was there, they could take for $150 a week. I started not only preaching faith, started living by faith. Big difference. Brother Clint never knew how it was coming in, but God's faithful. It always came in. There were times that I was slinging paint. There was times I was helping him put roofs on or trying to keep him from falling off a ladder. There were times when I was working for an electrical company. There was times I was doing something that the Lord provided. I'll never forget. One January, Miss Nett told me how much money we needed to get out of the month. Well, Brother Ray didn't have any work. It was cold. It was January. I didn't have any work. Six hundred something dollars could have been a million. It didn't matter. We didn't have it. <clears throat> I told her, "Well, the Lord's going to have to do something." getting up toward the end of the month my insurance man called me I said preacher what are you doing you know, I tried to act spiritual you know like I was really doing something but I wasn't I was just sitting there at the house he said uh, can you come down to the office I said sure it was nothing new there was times you know he would talk about a new product or let me know about something switch some of my stuff around and all that so nothing new you know so I went down there and met with him and it's just small talk. And I think, why am I here? And finally, he slides a check across the table. He said, or across his desk. He said, Lord woke me up today and told me to give you that. Uh, you know, again, I'm acting spiritual. I wanted to flip it over and see how much it was, but I didn't. Uh, but Donald is exactly what we needed to get out of the month. But see, God doesn't operate just on... The need. Then he said, Preacher, you like ribs? Mm. Duh. And then he gave me $100 gift cards to Montgomery Inn to go get some ribs. That's just how God does things. Yeah. I'm telling you, all that was hidden to me. But God knew all along what he was going to do. See, he held nothing back without seeing ahead what's going to happen. See, when you can figure it all out, that's not faith, that's logic. And Ornan didn't hold back. He didn't sit there and say, well, David, let me figure all this out, and I'll let you know. He just gave it all. And I say this, he held nothing back in lieu of his heritage. I've spent a lot talking about his history. But you know, the only thing he had to give his boys was that threshing floor. And now he's going to have to go home and say, Boys, I just threw your future away. It's gone. So where did it go? Gave it to God. King David came by and said he needed it for the Lord, and I just gave it to him. In lieu of his heritage, he held nothing back. See, a lot of you, or spend too much time looking at your 401k and God help you if you're looking at it every day right now. But I'd be more concerned with pleasing God than your future when it comes to your 401k. Now don't get me wrong, you need to plan for the future. I'm not saying don't store up. I'm not saying plan not to plan. I'm not saying that. But don't let that get in the way of trusting God. You can get so bogged down, worried about all that stuff, you won't even listen to God. He held nothing back. Lou of his heritage. Can I say this? He held nothing back with no hope. He had no expectations of how much David would give him for the field. As a matter of fact, he told David he didn't want anything. He just gave it all. The king was saying, oh, if you're giving it, you're getting full price. But he did it with no expectation. It amazes me, Brother Aaron, how many people will serve God if they think they're getting something in return. And it's the same people when they testify, all they, all they ever testify about is 
is about what somebody gave them or how much money they got. They never talk about the goodness of God regardless of the money. Listen, I know we need money. That's why we work a job, but huh? you don't go punch a clock at GE because you're bored. No, no, no. You need money to survive, and God provides it. He give you the ability, he give you the job, he give you all the. But Ornan put no constraints on giving it all. Hmm? A lot of people say, "Lord, I'll do this if you'll do this." God don't work that way. Hmm? Why don't you just say, "Lord, I'm just give it all." Huh? Lord, here's a bank page. My name's written on it. You fill in the page, whatever you want. Here it is. Give it all. And then I thought about this lastly. Ornan held nothing back. He gave it all without hesitation. David said, I need this. Said, okay, here. And by the way, king, if you need the floor, why don't you take the oxen? Why don't you take the wood? Why don't you take the wheat? You can have it all. There it is. Without hesitation. David only asked for the threshing floor. Hmm? But he gave it all. What can I say? 3,000 years later, we're still talking about Ornan the Jebusite. You talk about a heritage. You talk about a history. You talk about somebody who impacted all of Israel. Just a little laborer that nobody really knew who gave it all. Now, what will God do with a church that just holds nothing back, gives it all? Lord, this is yours. This is your land. This is your church. This is all yours. God, what you really want, here it is. Just mind the Lord. Without hesitation. What would God do with our church if we all held nothing back? Hmm? Thank God for those that don't. We got folks that give and folks that do and folks that are involved. But we still hold back a little bit, don't we? I wonder what would happen if we just gave it all. We lived every day under this umbrella. Lord, what I have is yours. You can have it all. I wonder what God would do in our lives. I wonder what he'd do in our church. I wonder how many lives would be impacted. Brother Sammy told us a week ago, 44 million people in the Caribbean alone. I wonder how many of them lives we could change. Hmm. Just giving it all. Hmm. Hold nothing back. If God comes by your seat and says, I want this from you, don't hesitate. Yes, Lord, here it is. I wonder what, wonder what he'd do in our church hmm. if we just hold nothing back. Hmm. Some of the greatest underdog stories always comes down to somebody who didn't hold back. They overcame insurmountable odds because they gave it their all. Can I help you with something? Very few people in this world give it their all. I wonder what God would do in our midst if we'd give it all. Stop holding back. Let God show you how big a God he really is. It all comes down to our attitude towards him. Let's all stand. Brother Clint, come get a song of invitation. God spoke to your heart. The altar's open. <clears throat> Folks are coming. He's picking out a song. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for the word of God. Thank you for the peace it gives. Thank you for the promises it gives. Thank you for the charges that it gives when it charges us to move out of our comfort zones and hold nothing back. Lord Ornan gave it all. And you pinned it down the word of God to, that we can see that Lord... Little's much in your hands. God, I pray you'd help us with the choices we make. 
Lord, help us to heed the warnings. God, when we do make mistakes, help us to be quick to repent. Then, God, help us not to hold anything back. God, speak to hearts. These in the altar, I pray you'd bless them, help them, whatever you're dealing with them over. God, if there's somebody here tonight who needs to do business with God, help them to come. God, do a work in people's hearts. We'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.